Have you ever thought about who the worst Jedi are? And no, Rey doesn't count. I think the worst Jedi in all of Star Wars is Pong Krell. You have to be a different kind of evil to make clones fight each other just for the sake of it. No one's as bad as Pong Krell, but Barriss Alfie is definitely close. Barriss didn't like the Jedi Order, which honestly I can understand, but then she decides the best thing to do is to bomb the Jedi Temple, and then on top of that she frames Ahsoka for the crime. This ends up being the reason Ahsoka leaves the Order, and obviously we're never going to forgive Barriss for it. Unlike Barriss, Dooku went about things the right way. Instead of bombing the temple he left the order. Unfortunately he let the dark side corrupt him anyway and he became Palpatine's apprentice. Similar to Dooku, Balin Skull also lost faith in the Jedi Order. After Order 66 he stopped following the Jedi Code and opted to dabble in the dark side of the force which is why his lightsaber is orange not red. Despite being a dark Jedi though, Balin still seemingly has good motives sometimes as he seeks to bring balance to the force. He just goes about it in all the wrong ways. Speaking of Dark Jedi, I have to mention Quinlan Voss. Voss is definitely the most erratic and interesting Jedi, to say the least. He has an eccentric personality, which we see put into action with his unorthodox methods, unlike that of any other Jedi. At some point in the Clone Wars, he fell to the dark side and actually tried to become Dooku's apprentice. Somehow, through a random series of events that aren't shown in the Clone Wars show, he actually comes back to the Jedi Council and keeps fighting until Order 66. We don't know what happens to him after that, but it is thought that he survived. But Coleman Trevor didn't even come close to surviving Order 66. In his only appearance in Attack of the Clones, Jango Fett takes him out in two shots. Another Jedi that got killed way too easily was Kit Fisto's former Padawan, Nadar Veb. In a duel with Grievous, Nadar Veb gave Grievous an opening to shoot him in the chest with one of his extra arms. It's a stupid way to go, but honestly, I'm cool with it. I love seeing Grievous in action. Jedi Master Stas Ali manages to die in an even stupider way, though. She dies in Order 66 while riding her bark speeder, unaware of the clone's betrayal. I mean, come on. She doesn't even move when both of her wingmen drop back. There is not a thought in those eyes. She has absolutely no clue what's going on. Jedi Master Halsey definitely died a much better death than Stas Ali, but he was pretty dumb as well. When Savage attacks the Jedi Temple on Devaron, Master Halsey bravely goes out to fight Savage, but in about three seconds, Savage knocks away Halsey's lightsaber with his staff. No lightsaber needed. Now this is the part where any smart person would have ran away and maybe gotten their lightsaber back, especially in this case. After all, Savage is three times the size of this guy. But no, Halsey thinks he can go body for body with Savage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so of course Savage wins. After that, the only thing that's left to defend the temple is Halsey's Padawan, Nox. But Nox manages to die the quickest death I've ever seen in Star Wars. I'll cut him a break though, since he is just a Padawan. Which reminds me, Nox isn't actually on this list, because I'm not going to include any younglings or Padawans on this list, with Barriss and a few others being exceptions. I'm basing my rankings off of how powerful these Jedi are, how well they follow the light side of the Force, and how much they do in Star Wars movies and TV shows. So in case you're wondering, no, I'm not going to be ranking every single Jedi that appeared in all the movies. I don't want to go through the Battle of Geonosis and identify every single Jedi or we'd be here for weeks. But back to the rankings, we've still got a lot of Jedi to go though. Like this man, Yarl Poof. And no, he's not actually a Kaminoan. Let me explain. Basically, George Lucas got the idea to introduce Kamino in Episode 2. In the concept art, they happen to look like Yarl Poof. The problem is, the Kaminoans are supposed to be completely unknown to the Jedi. So what's the solution then, George? Ah, well, let's just say Yarl disappeared on a mission, and he's some random species that's not Kaminoan. And for good measure, we'll replace him with Coleman Trevor, of all people. <laughs> anyway, Yarl Poof seems like he could have been a cool character, but at the end of the day, he doesn't really do anything, which is why he's here on this list. Just like Oppo Rancis, another unique looking Jedi to say the least. Oppo Rancis was also on the council like Poof. He just gets to sit there way longer than Poof, all the way through Revenge of the Sith until Order 66. We don't know what happened to him, so I wouldn't be surprised if we actually get something from him in the future. Jedi Master Tiplar had the unfortunate luck of having Order 66 executed early on her of all people. Yes, she's the Jedi Tup kills in the Clone Wars. Aside from this moment, Tiplar doesn't really do anything, but clearly she was pretty powerful as she was a high-ranking Jedi General who led an elite force of clones under Commander Dooku. These guys have really cool armor, by the way. Her sister Tiply lives on after Ringo Venda, but she is killed by Dooku while fighting Darth Maul's Shadow Collective shortly before Maul took Mandalore. Jedi Master Bola Rapal was also killed on Dooku's orders, but by Cad Bane. He was captured by Bane while trying to protect a holocron. Not a good look for a Jedi, but at least he died heroically by not giving up the holocron's information. Yet another Jedi who was killed by Dooku is Master Yaddle. She's the female counterpart to Yoda. She sat on the Jedi Council until she fought Dooku in a duel, where Dooku completely destroyed her. I'm starting to see a trend here. If you cross Dooku, good luck with that, my friend. Terra Sinub was also on the Jedi Council with Yaddle, for a time. Surprisingly, he decided to step down from his position and trained younglings instead. He gets his big moment in the Clone Wars show, when he randomly decides to go along and help Ahsoka find her lightsaber. A massive chase through Coruscant ensues, and Terra Sinub duels and defeats the thief. 
If it weren't for him, Ahsoka would have been in big trouble. Sadly, at some point along the way after Order 66, Tara Sinu was killed. In Kenobi Episode 4, Obi-Wan finds a bunch of Jedi bodies that had been petrified and were on display. Tara Sinu was among them. Jedi Master Keller and Beck also worked with Jedi younglings. Ironically, he was introduced in a Star Wars kids show called the Jedi Temple Challenge, so he's the only Jedi that can say he hosted a TV game show. But he did actually do something way more important than that, though. He personally saved Grogu from Order 66. So we have Keller and Beck to thank for the entire plot of the Mandalorian series, basically. And as far as we know, he may still be alive, so we may hear from him again in the future. Next, we've got a confusing pair of Jedi, but don't worry, I got you. Jedi Masters Agent Kolar and Eeth Koth are both from the same species. They both look the exact same, and both served on the Jedi Council. Eeth Koth was on the Council until Revenge of the Sith, when suddenly he was replaced by Agent Kolar. The reason for this is because Eeth Koth's actor couldn't be in Revenge of the Sith, and I guess George Lucas was too lazy to change anything about the character except for his name. Eeth Koth's story is that he stepped down from his seat on the Council and left the Order, so that he could go start a family. Eventually, Vader hunted him down and killed him. While he was in the Order, Eeth Koth was a pretty mid-Jedi. He nearly died at Geonosis, and in the Clone Wars show, the main thing he did was get captured by Grievous. Agent Kolar doesn't do anything notable either, except he got to be saber fodder for Palpatine when the Jedi came to arrest him. In my humble opinion, Agent Kolar shouldn't exist at all, but whatever. Jedi Master Say C-10 was next to Agent Kolar when he died, so it only makes sense that I put Master 10 here. He was a great Jedi in many respects, and he was known as one of, if not the best Starfighter pilot in the Order. We see that on display when he helps rescue Anakin and Obi-Wan from the Citadel prison. Like Agent Kolar, he also served on the Council, which is a clear indication of his commitment to the Order. Unfortunately, right after Agent Kolar, CC-10 gets destroyed by Palpatine in one hit, so that really hurts his chances of being ranked higher. The reason CC-10 came to the Citadel in the first place was because Master Evan Piel had been imprisoned there. Master Piel was an irregular Jedi because he was so down to earth. He often spoke in blunt, straightforward terms because he didn't believe in the bureaucracy of the Senate and the Jedi Order. Unlike most Jedi, he related to many common people and was easily able to make friendships with them because of this sentiment. As a result, he was much closer to the Force in a way many Jedi weren't. Although he was a seasoned veteran, by the time of the Clone Wars, Master Piel was actually really old. That's why he ended up getting captured and imprisoned at the Citadel, and eventually he died there. Master Adi Gallia also made friends with many common people in the Republic because she was born on Coruscant. She was used to going through the numerous levels of Coruscant, interacting with all kinds of people. This gave her a much broader perspective than most Jedi, who were more often than not were clothed off and stayed at the temple all the time. As such, she became a great diplomat, and she always sought to negotiate first rather than fight. However, this meant that she didn't train with her lightsaber nearly as much as she should have. When she faced Savage on Florum, she was completely unprepared and died when Savage headbutted her in the stomach. Let's get away from some lame Jedi Council members for a bit though. How about Cal Kestis? Now I know some of you are saying, but Eli, how can you put Cal above Jedi who were literally on the Council? And yeah, fair enough. But I think part of being a good Jedi isn't all about what you do in the Order. After all, the reason Jedi Order collapsed is because it got corrupted. It was less of a way of life and more of an institution. We see Cal's growth in Fallen Order and that he's clearly good at heart, with good intentions behind his actions. He also has numerous unique Force powers like Force Stasis and his special connection with nature and animals. He's also proficient in pretty much any lightsaber style. He's able to fight with one lightsaber as well as two, or double blades with equal skill in all. With that in mind, now you might be wondering why he's not higher on this list. And the reason for that is we don't know the rest of Cal's story yet. No spoilers, but Cal is having some trouble with the dark side. Don't get me wrong, that's okay to an extent, but it's unclear how far Cal will go with that, so we'll have to wait for the sequel to Jedi Survivor to find out. But Cal wouldn't have gotten as far as he did in his Jedi training if it weren't for his master, Seer Junda. Now, to be fair, Cal in many ways is probably stronger than Seer, but I don't think we can definitively say that until after the third Jedi game comes out. And Seer is very powerful in her own right. She possessed numerous Force powers and was clearly very well connected to the Force. Unfortunately, I can't rank her any higher because of her tendency to slip into the dark side. She had her heroic moment when she allowed herself to be captured by the Empire in order to save some younglings, but none of that mattered as she succumbed to torture from Darth Vader. After seeing her Padawan turned into an Inquisitor, she flew into a fit of rage and killed a ton of Imperials at the facility where she was being held. However, However, she didn't fall to the dark completely, and she definitely redeemed herself by joining the Mantis crew and training Cal. Should Cal and Sierra be higher on my list, or is this a good ranking? Go let me know in the comments. Next is a Jedi we don't really know much about at all, but his actions are pretty much what sets the entire Star Wars saga into motion. That person is Master Sifo Dyas. And no, that's not an alias for Darth Sidious. This guy was an actual Jedi that wasn't working for the Sith. He had the gift of foresight, and he saw the war coming to the Republic. He thought the Jedi would need an army. Obviously, the Jedi didn't like that, so they kicked him off the council. Sifo 
Diaz said screw that and hired the Kaminoans on his own to make an army for the Republic anyway. But this is where it gets interesting. Remember how I said not to cross Dooku? Sifo Diaz made the mistake of telling Dooku about his plan to start an army. And at this point, Dooku was already working for Sidious. So Dooku hired people to shoot down Sifo Diaz's ship and he died in the crash. That allowed Sidious to take over the production of the army and add the inhibitor chips along the way. So the way I see it, Sifo Diaz had it right all along. He just had terrible luck. And even if he didn't really have screen time, aside from a couple moments in the Clone Wars show, I think he deserves to get ranked up here. In my 17th spot, I've got Ezra Bridger. Some of you might hate me for this ranking, but let me explain myself. First of all, I think we can all agree that Ezra has a lot of potential. He's clearly very powerful, but at the same time, he hasn't received the same level of training that many Jedi experienced, so he's definitely behind in that sense. Because of that, Ezra has a tendency to lean towards the dark side. He often acts in a brash, reckless manner, which is something someone who's truly in the light side would not do. Sure, he didn't give in to Maul or any of the other temptations he faced in the Rebel show, but I still think the fact stands. In the same way, Ezra might have also given in to the dark side in all the time he spent with Thrawn after Lothal, although we don't know that for certain yet, but Thrawn is definitely a very convincing guy. Also, if I'm being honest with you guys, I just don't like Ezra all that much. I always found his character annoying. Sure, for most of the Rebel show, he's just a kid, but still, that really got on my nerves. Another character I also find annoying is Master Kiadi Mundi, except I think I've got a legit reason for disliking him, as a person and as a Jedi. First of all, the Jedi are supposed to be free from attachments, but Kiadi Mundi had five wives, strictly on the basis that his species needed him to reproduce. Like I said in my Jedi Council video, he used all of his big head to come up with that one. What about the droid attack on the Wookiees? He also led the Galactic Marines, a clone force known for its excessive brutality and aggressive fighting style. As the saying goes, I think a group takes on the traits of its leader, which speaks volumes of Kiadi Mundi's true personality. And whether you believe in Star Wars war crimes or not, there's no denying that Mundi's use of flamethrowers is totally unnecessary, and it definitely brought unnecessary pain to the Geonosians, which is completely against the Jedi way. Mundi also clearly wasn't very in tune with the Force. I think Qui-Gon had the right idea in that the Force is a living force that guides your life and your actions. Kiadi Mundi instead believed in logic alone, which was clearly a blind spot in his connection to the light side of the Force. We see this blind use of logic play out when Ahsoka is framed for the bombing of the Jedi Temple. Mundi was the most vocal in condemning Ahsoka. His reason? Pure logic. Ahsoka was with the bomber at the time of her death, so that sealed it for Mundi. He had no intention of giving Ahsoka any benefit of the doubt or to try to look at the situation from another angle, like Obi-Wan, Plo Koon, or Anakin did. All of this culminates to my main point. Kiadi Mundi isn't that good of a Jedi because he's not a true follower of the light side of the Force, and within the Jedi Order institution itself, he doesn't even follow the Jedi Code very well at all. Next up, I've got Jedi Master Luminara Unduli. She has a ton of bad luck in her appearances in the Clone Wars show. She has to duel Ventress with one eye, she gets captured by Geno's and zombies, and her Padawan Barris turns to the dark side. So with that in mind, I know you want to know why she's so high on this list. I think in many ways, Luminara is a female version of Obi-Wan, who I consider to be the model of what a true Jedi is. Just like Obi-Wan, Luminara is reserved, patient, and extremely disciplined. She had complete control of her emotions, and she didn't hold any unnecessary attachments. She wasn't afraid of death, as she understood that when the time came, it would be the will of the Force. Even after being disarmed by Ventress, or facing the prospect of being controlled by zombie worms, she wasn't afraid. She kept a cool head and always tried to look out for others above herself. She wasn't as proficient as some Jedi in lightsaber combat, as she preferred peaceful negotiations over a fight. Ultimately, Luminar's lack of fighting ability called up to her, as she was captured and executed by Inquisitors after Order 66. While fighting should never be a Jedi's first option, being a good duelist is absolutely necessary to carrying out Jedi duties, so I can't rank Luminara any higher for that reason. Luminara was also very modest, opting to wear simple black robes that covered everything except for her face. So Ayla Secura's outfit comes in sharp contrast to Luminara. George Lucas really had to think for Twi'leks, that's for sure. Ayla Secura was a role model for Ahsoka in many ways. Ayla was a great fighter and leader, commanding the 327th across numerous battlefields like Geonosis, Quell, and Felucia. Sakura believed in a balance between the discipline of Luminara and the recklessness of Anakin. She jokingly told Admiral Yularen that only the good Jedi are reckless. In contrast to that side of her, she also displays great discipline in her relationships. Her master Quinlan Voss was often a bad influence, as he would later fall to the dark side. When Ayla realized this, she distanced herself from him. Surprisingly, Ayla noticed this with Ahsoka's relationship with Anakin. Ayla told Ahsoka that she should learn to let go of her relationship with Anakin for the greater good. Turns out, Ayla was right, and unlike most Jedi, Ayla was extremely extremely compassionate and sympathetic to her clone subordinates. She had a close relationship with Commander Bly and her other officers, which makes her death at Order 66 that much more emotional to watch. 
This next Jedi survived Order 66, but she was so important that Sidious sent Darth Vader and the Grand Inquisitor himself to hunt her down. You probably never even think about this Jedi, because her role in the Jedi Order seems unimportant. It's the Chief Librarian Jocasta Nu. By the time we see her initially in The Phantom Menace and in the Clone Wars show, Jocasta Nu is very, very old. Her Force powers have diminished, and she's not the best in lightsaber combat, but she still has much to offer. As head of the Jedi Archives, Jocasta Nu controlled the single biggest vault of information in the galaxy. She knew where the information on anything and everything was located in the archives, and she knew many things by her own memory and intuition. Sidious himself even noted that she held more knowledge than anyone else in the galaxy. She personally taught extremely wise individuals like Qui-Gon Jinn and Count Dooku everything they knew. As such, she had a close relationship with Qui-Gon, and shared many of his views on the Force, which displays her true connection to the light side, unlike most Jedi. Somehow, despite her old age and the fact that she was centrally located in the Jedi Temple, Jocasta Nu escaped Order 66 and managed to take a bunch of holocrons with her. Unfortunately, the Empire found her a eventually, but she was still able to put up a short fight against Vader. Interestingly enough, the Empire wasn't going to kill her, but it turns out that she knew Vader was Anakin Skywalker. She told this to Vader and a bunch of his troopers, so naturally Vader killed her and all of her men that heard it to protect his identity. Still though, Jocasta News showed a lot of courage and bravery in facing Vader alone like that, but Jedi Master I'm a Gun D may have even topped her bravery. While he only appears in one Clone Wars episode, what little we see of Master D is downright awesome, and he clearly exemplifies many of the best traits a Jedi should have. We can tell in his heroics at Ryloth that he was not only a great leader, but an intelligent and compassionate one as well. He is well respected and loved by the clones under his command, and he drew up a plan that bought the Twi'leks enough time to escape. Master D could have easily not cared about the Twi'leks, and once the Republic's air support was cut, I'm sure Master D knew that he and his forces were totally doomed. But rather than retreat or surrender, he met the Separatists head on. He was completely willing to selflessly sacrifice himself for them. I think all of those things speak volumes about him as a Jedi, not to mention his fighting ability as he took on an army of droids by himself. Master D was clearly in tune with the light side of the Force, as he was willing to go wherever the Force took him. The Force sure took Anakin some crazy places. This is going to be a hot take, but I'm ranking Anakin in the 11th spot on this list. Some of you are going to be mad that I didn't put him higher. To that I say, Anakin just wasn't that good of a Jedi. He turned to the dark side for one thing, and he definitely committed some more crimes along the way. And he had a serious attachment issue with Padme, so he broke numerous parts of the Jedi code. To those of you saying I should put him even lower, here's the deal. Whether you like it or not, Anakin is the chosen one, and that is significant. Let's face it, the bad that Anakin does is outweighed by the good he does throughout the war, saving countless worlds from the Separatists. He was the biggest hero the Jedi had, the best starfighter, pilot, fighter, you name it. And at the end of the day, he redeemed himself by killing Palpatine and bringing balance to the Force. I focused on the Force aspect of being Jedi a lot earlier in this video, and I think it counts for a lot. Anyway, flame me in the comments if you want, but I think 11th is a solid place for Anakin, right outside the top 10. Could have been a great one, but a lot held him back. Entering the top 10 now, these are by far the best Jedi of all time. First up, I've got Master Shock T, the Jedi Master that has died more times than we can count. No, but seriously, the reason why I've got Shock T this far up on the list is because of her vital role in the Clone Wars. Shock T was stationed on Kamino to oversee the training of clone cadets. She made sure that young clones were treated as human beings, not droids being sent out to war. She was able to see unique traits in each and every clone, and she also believed in giving the clones second chances, contrary to the harsh system the bounty hunter trainers had in place. Because of that, she's a big reason why Domino Squad, which included future ARC troopers Fives and Echo, were able to complete their training. In Domino Squad's training, we see Chok T's wisdom and patience when dealing with the young clones. She also opposed the Kaminoans' ruthless methods of dealing with clones. When the Kaminoans wanted to turn Terminate Fives, Shock T opposed it and saved Fives. She was also a big part of protecting and defending Kamino against the Separatist invasion in an attempt to steal Jango Fett's DNA. Throughout the invasion, she remained calm and collected as she directed the defense. That's a good way to start off the top 10. And coming in at number 9, I have Caleb Doom. Wait, who's that? Oh, you probably know him as Kanan Jarrus. I know some of you are already thinking about his relationship with Hera. Isn't that completely breaking the Jedi Code? Maybe it does from a certain point of view. However, when you think about it, not having attachments means letting someone or something be too important. When the time comes, you can't let them go. This is what happens with Anakin and Padme. Pretty much every bad thing that Anakin does is on the pretense of his love and attachment to Padme. Kanan is the polar opposite of this. His love for Hera is a relationship that strengthens him and makes him better. And when the time came, he let go and sacrificed himself. Being a Jedi is more than just following the Jedi Code to the letter. It's about a person's journey with the light side of the Force. The Code is simply practical guidelines that prevent someone from falling into the dark side. While it's not canon, Luke Skywalker marries Mara Jade and starts a family. I think this is also a great example of how a dedicated light side user can still have romantic relationships. It draws them closer to the Force, not towards the dark side. This makes Kanan a much better Jedi. All of that aside, Kanan is also a great Jedi as a mentor to Ezra and as the leader of the Ghost crew. He was 
was always patient with Ezra, despite how annoying Ezra is, like I said earlier. Despite having not much formal Jedi training, Kanan was extremely competent in lightsaber combat too. He knew three different lightsaber forms, and he personally defeated the Grand Inquisitor. In sharp contrast to Kanan, the next Jedi on my list is Mace Windu. Man, Samuel L. Jackson with the purple lightsaber just never gets old. There's so many great things I could say about Mace, so let me tell you why he's not ranked any higher on this list. Being a Jedi is more than just following the Jedi code to the letter. Unfortunately for Mace, this is often how he saw being a Jedi. To his credit, Mace is extremely disciplined and does things by the book, but in trying to do everything correctly, Mace lost his compassion and connection to the light side. Just like Kiadi Mundi, who focused on logic, Mace didn't allow the light side to guide his path. The Clone Wars only served to highlight these negative traits in Mace. His only focus was on winning the war. Mace wasn't really worried about the potential cost to the Republic or the Separatists. It was all about defeating the bad guys, which is not the Jedi way at all. And most importantly, his obsession with the rules destroyed his relationship with Anakin. Mace only saw Anakin as an annoyance, maybe even a threat, instead of another human and a Jedi in need of mentorship. Mace is one of the main factors that helps Anakin turn to the dark side. With all of that in mind, I just can't rank Mace any higher than 8th, especially with all of the great Jedi we've got coming up, like my man Kit Fisto. Kit Fisto is a super fun Jedi. He's laid back and easygoing, but he can also be super intense and observant. Mace Windu, one of the best duelists in the Order, claimed Kit Fisto was among the greatest duelists of all time. He was adept at using one or two lightsabers in combat, and we see that on display with his unique fighting style when he dueled Grievous. He fought Grievous on multiple occasions, and one time he even cut Grievous' legs off. Kit Fisto was also a critical part of the underwater war on Mon Cal in the Clone Wars Season 4. Since Kit's species had the ability to breathe underwater, he was one of the logical choices to help Anakin and Ahsoka with defeating the Separatists. Of course, given Kit's skills and achievements, he was a natural selection for the Jedi Council. While not all Council members are created equally, it definitely means you're a better Jedi than most. The most important thing, of course, is that Kit Fisto was truly committed to the light side of the Force. That is a defining trait of our next Jedi, Ahsoka Tano. She's easily one of the most skilled fighters in the Order. Ahsoka went on more military missions than pretty much anyone, and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Maul, Ventress, and more. She's also extremely compassionate and caring for others, particularly those in need. Whether it was innocents caught in the war, her clone subordinates, or people enslaved by the Zygerians, Ahsoka cared for everyone. Throughout her life, she demonstrates selfless giving of herself, time and time again. And yes, she left the Order, but for good reason. She saw how the Order had become corrupted by Jedi like Hyati Mundi. She realized that the only way to pursue her future in the light side of the Force was to leave completely. To stay would be detrimental to her. In this, she displays her commitment to being a Jedi. She's one of the few people that truly embodies what it means to be a Jedi. Qui-Gon Jinn did the same, but to a lesser extent. He rejected an offer to join the Jedi Council because he knew it wasn't good for him. He recognized that the Force had a different path for him, and his views clashed with that of the Council. For example, the Jedi had no problem with the Republic turning a blind eye to slavery with its orders or in the galaxy at large. Qui-Gon thought something should be done about this. We see this in his interactions with Anakin and Shmi. Qui-Gon wanted to free both of them, not just Anakin. But why did Qui-Gon hold such unique views? That's because Qui-Gon was among the most well connected to the Force. He was known as a wise, spiritually oriented Jedi, and that's what led him to Tatooine to discover Anakin. He understood and believed the prophecy of the Chosen One, even when no one else did. He was the crazy one in the room for actually understanding the Force, which is a big indicator of how far the Order had lost his way. As a result of that understanding, Qui-Gon was the first Jedi to become a Force ghost, and he even taught Yoda and Obi-Wan how to do the same. Unfortunately, Qui-Gon was not as adept at lightsaber combat as some other Jedi, as we see in his duel with Maul. This is mainly due to the fact that in Qui-Gon's time, Jedi didn't have to fight much. Also, in his duel with Maul, we have to remember that Maul was in his prime, with a never-seen-before fighting style, while Qui-Gon was older and weaker than he would have been in years past. In contrast, one of Qui-Gon's closest friends, Plo Koon, was extremely skilled at fighting, and gained a ton of combat experience in the Clone Wars. The two were close because Plo was empathetic of Qui-Gon's plight. Plo shared many views with Qui-Gon, but saw it as his duty to serve on the Council anyway. But he understood Qui-Gon's reasoning for not wanting to join, unlike the other Council members. Plo was also a member to Ahsoka. In many ways, they had a relationship like that of a father and a daughter, so many of her best traits were acquired from him. He was also exceptionally caring and a compassionate leader. As such, his clones of the Wolf Pack loved and respected him, because he knew them by name and sought out their well-being. His clones even went as far as to paint Plo's face on the side of the battalion's gunships with the inscription, Plo's Bros. The clones were like family to him. That's what makes his death so much more emotional at Order 66, because he never knew that they were doing it against their will. And with that, we're in the top three. The third best Jedi of all is Master Yoda, the only Grand Master of the Order and the leader of the Jedi Council. Yoda did a lot. He was extremely wise and one of the most powerful or sensitive beings to ever exist. Need I say more? He survived Order 66 and a duel with Sidious, and managed to stay alive long enough to train Luke Skywalker, so that Luke was prepared to take on Vader and eventually Palpatine himself. Speaking of which, 
Luke is actually the second best Jedi on my list. Sure, Luke didn't receive any formal Jedi training like most. Most of his power is left untapped in the original movies. He is not the best duelist or the wisest Jedi, but this is his advantage. Luke is incredibly pure in his motives and decision making. He really wants nothing more than to save his friends and the rebellion, and he'll do whatever it takes to accomplish that. Because he was never tainted by the corruption of the Jedi Order, Luke, like Ahsoka, is free to be closer to the light side of the Force. That's what brings him so much power. Through that, Luke, with help from Vader, is the only person who was able to defeat Darth Sidious, despite multiple attempts by those who came before him, including Yoda. Luke helps fulfill the prophecy about Anakin and restores balance to the Force, which is the single most important event in the Star Wars saga. There's really no better Jedi than Luke, except for one. Obi-Wan Kenobi is the archetype of the perfect Jedi. He's clever, incredibly disciplined, patient, and most of all, he cares about the greater good with no thought of himself. Obi-Wan fought more villains than anyone, whether it was Maul, Dooku, Grievous, Savage, Vader, you name it. He beat them more often than not, and when he didn't, he trusted that things would work out. And when his world came crashing down around him after Order 66, he didn't let that face him. He stayed focused on the path ahead of him. The thing is, Obi-Wan always trusted the Force, despite all the things that happened to him. In my opinion, that's the most important part of being a Jedi. If you like this video, you should check out the one on the screen. I know you'll love it.